Thank you, Pastor. Want to greet each and every one of you today. It's a joy to be here. It's a privilege to see each and every one of you. And I would like to say, for the sake of the internet and who's hooked on, we want you to know we're fully aware that you're hooked on today. And we pray that we can say some things that's uplifting and edifying, as well as learning in the things that we are endeavoring, endeavoring to teach, to instruct, and to inform each and every one of us. Now, as I would point to the chart, I'd like to remind each and every one of us, from this point right here, over to the end here, where we see the coming of the Lord, that represents the last 100 years. Actually, that corresponds to the Laodicean church age. When I say the last 100 years, we have to learn to have a little bit of biblical history, what has went on in this last 100 years. Now, through, the, <clears throat> through these lessons, we take from what Jesus said in Matthew 24, and where he said, and thou shalt hear, wars and rumors of wars. But he said, the end is not yet. That covers all through the history of time. But then he comes precisely to the statements. And there shall be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. Said, all of these are the beginnings of sorrows. We want to illustrate to you this morning that has absolutely took place starting in the last 100 years. Especially, I'm going to give you the statistics on earthquakes. Increase of earthquakes was to be a sign that we're approaching the end time. In the 15th century, there was 150 earthquakes recorded. In the 16th, each, remember, each century is 100 years. In the 16th century, there was 153 recorded earthquakes. When we come to the, seven, uh, the 17th century, we have 378 recorded earthquakes. When we come to the 18th century, it almost doubled. 640 recorded earthquakes. But when we come to the 19th century, which we've just passed through, 2,119 recorded earthquakes. And it gives the numbers of deaths in different places and amounts to over a million. Always remember, brothers and sisters, many places throughout the earth because they've been more or less looked upon as, we will say, third-rate areas, many times the devastation is almost left unrecorded. But it's what comes out of the disaster. Many times it has caused mountains to slide in. It's caused upheavals. Entire villages to disappear. So we cannot say that we're not living in the times these are the beginnings of sorrows. Will you agree with me? All right. Now then, yesterday morning, we approached then the book of Revelation to begin to break it down and show you each chapter where it fits in time. And I said, we do not look at this that 7 follows 6, nor 12 follows 11. You don't do it that way. You look at the picture, and you look and see where that fits into time. And there's where many times you're surprised. And I want to say this morning, when you take a look at the whole writing, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ, not in fleshly form. But it is a revelation of Jesus Christ through his word to a certain element of people. And that's the end time bride of Christ. Because keep in mind, the church world would say, well, you're crazy to call yourself that. And I would have to say right back to them, you're ignorant. 
to not know what the book says. Because the last words in the last chapter of the book of Revelation, the Spirit and the bride say come. And when you come into the, the, the book of Revelation, it also says that in that day the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Well, we come to find out, brothers and sisters, the church world today don't even care much what, it's, what it contains. They'll say it's irrelevant. It don't matter. Well, then what did God write have it written for? So if it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, then I have to believe that there's an element of people on earth that he's going to reveal himself, not in the physical form, but you will see him absolutely taking the word and begin to talk to you. And because you have an earnest heart and a hunger to learn and to know, this makes you want to be receptive to it. So now as we look at the last 100 years, we have to begin to realize we are fast approaching the beginning of Daniel 7 this week. It hasn't started yet. But with all the signs and indicators in the Middle East, we are approaching rapidly to the time when that thing will be compelled by God to be brought into existence. Now then, let's take a look. Let's look at the 13th chapter. Well, it follows 12. Don't look at that away. Look at the picture. John saw this terrible beast rising up. Now listen, as he watched the sea, don't think that it's just a submarine floating along out of the water and all of a sudden it bursts through the... You've got to acquaint it with time. So time began to bring that beast back into circulation. So slowly it begins to rise out of the waters. It's not until it is out exposed that he can describe it. But he saw it coming. And I want to say this morning, that 13th chapter, you could write it right up here in a line. I can prove it by history. Because that's when that Roman beast began to slowly. You have to study church history and begin to see what the Pope began to do just prior to the break of World War I. The Vatican began to realize they had to begin to do something. So they began to work through their circles. And all of these things, brothers and sisters, are not written in secular history. They're only recorded as religious-minded people began to investigate. Then, as I said, this is the era <clears throat> that began to bring an end to the colonial era. Didn't I say that? Who brought an end to the Spanish in the Philippines? Spanish and American War, wasn't it? What about Puerto Rico? The Americans had to fight the Spanish down there. This was a slow beginning of the breakup of the colonial clutches that the powers of the world have held. Then we come into World War I. And I want to say this morning, I'm not lifting up America, but remember America was made out of an immigrant people. And those people, when they came here, became glad to be a part of this continent. It didn't matter whether they were Russian, Japanese, Spanish, or what. They became blended together, and they thought alike. And it took that caliber of people to build this nation into what it has become. When Europe then began to go through all their political breakups, then you had a Kaiser Wilhelm. He was thirsty for power and territory. Already in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution is on the move. The world is entering that era. This is the beginning of many sorrows. World War I was fought. And if it had not been for the American nation, going over there and dying on the battlefields, World War I would not have ended like it did. But it came to an end. So they formed the League of Nations. 
But that still didn't stop the, the thrust. Twenty years later, another dictator, Hitler in 33 A.D., I mean in 1933, he came to power. Six years later, he too went on the march. And yesterday I read to you, when that thing began, the nations that became involved eventually in a global conflict, nation against king, nation, kingdom against kingdom. When World War II came to an end in 1945, Europe was laying in ruins. Keep your mind on that 13th chapter. It's overshadowing this whole era. That beast is getting out more and more visible. And that lamb beast that follows right after it. That's not out of the island somewhere. That's out of a part of the earth that was not even known in the days that John the Revelator lived. It was not even known until 1492. And then it was 200 years before it began to be recognized as a place that people wanted to immigrate to. By the time we then do begin to come, brothers and sisters, in the latter part of 1800s, all eyes begin to fasten and towards this part of the world. World War II has brought in existence. And if it had not been for America, brothers and sisters, that went in there with their technology, and thousands of men died and shed their blood. I have to say today, Europe would not be in the shape it's in. There would be an evil tyrant dictator of some nature in, in, in power. No sooner is it brought to an end than when you read that latter part of the 13th chapter, this land beast was never a nation that wanted to conquest, take land. And the other day, the question was confronted before Powell. Something about, why are we doing in Iraq and everything? And we went in there to, to claim some land, and he says, America never has wanted any land, only enough to bury the dead. That they have died and paid for the freedom and the liberty for other peoples. So it might do us well to think about some of these things. And I have seen, brothers and sisters, the traces of World War II. From Norway, barbed wire, gun emplacements, that the Germans walked over them. A submarine place at Trondheim. They took Rus Russian prisoners and worked them to death. And when they got too weak to work, they pushed them off in the wet concrete. And their bones are there in the concrete of Trondheim today. From there to southern Italy is the scars of the war. That men have bled and died and guns have bombarded. Planes have flew over. Factories lie in ruins. And if I showed you brothers and sisters, when that miserable war was at an end, it begins to tell you in here the statistics. This nation stood at the gates of the White House, wanted so many million, both the enemy and our friends. That means, brothers and sisters, you and I have been paying the, through tax dollars what them nations came here to borrow. And virtually none of it has ever been repaid. But that's the land beast. Now with that in mind, let's drop back to that same period of time. We come into the 60s. We had a messenger. And it wasn't Dr. Doolittle, nor Professor Hickenluber. It was a little man by the name of William Branham with a sixth grade education, but an anointing of on him. He said things that would literally stupefy a doctor of divinity. I have seen Catholic priests on the platform when that God would start using that man through that gift. And brother, out of their pockets they would take handkerchiefs and wipe the tears from their eyes as they sat there crying. 
Never had they saw anything like it. They thought that's all the man is supposed to do. God was merciful to let him see him display his power. But then when he began to go into the book and bring out certain things to touch their miserable doctrines and creeds, oh, that's out of the pit of hell. Well, that's where they got their creeds. It's how they interpreted it and traditionalized it and didn't want nobody to come along to tear it apart. But that little man began to go back. And brothers and sisters, he picked up where Luther began, then Calvin and Knox, Wesley, then the Pentecostal era. He has touched all these eras of these great men on the evangelistic field. And he brought everything right up to date. And after he began to preach a lot of things that they didn't like, the crowds began to thin out. But for some reason or other, there was a bunch of little ignoramus creatures like you and me. We began to feel that, God, that guy's got something other I don't want to lose contact with. And God led him supernaturally to Arizona in 1963. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know them seals that we read about in the sixth chapter. Man have been reading it in the symbols for all these years. But now Jesus Christ is going to absolutely come off of the pages and start revealing himself to a people. He tucked that little man out there and gave him an experience. And brothers and sisters, when he came back here, yes, there was people that came from everywhere. And when that man that first night stood there in the pulpit, he read the introduction, how John was taken up into heaven, and he saw the one sitting on the throne it was none other than Jesus Christ in his immortal flesh. But the time has came, not in the dark ages, not in 19 and 13, nor 19 and 40, or 1950, but in 1963, the revelation of Jesus Christ began to come off of the written page. And that man took them seals one by one. And when he reads, when he goes into the sixth chapter, the first thing he heard, verse number one, when the Lamb had taken and opened the first seal, there was a sound of a thunder, which meant God's going to speak. And somebody on earth is going to hear it. Now, God didn't come and stand on the balconies of heaven and yell great big, Hey, you down there! He had a little bitty vessel that everybody had thought had gone off on the deep end. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, there was a thunder in the spirit world. But that little man knew how to equate himself to that. And he took that revelation, brothers and sisters, and he brought you down through that first white horse rider, then the second horse rider, the red. Then the third horse rider, that black horse. Then he brings you to the gray horse. And it shows you how these horses have been riding through the century. That rips tradition all to pieces. And brothers and sisters, when we come to the fifth seal, you've heard what I've said about it before. But that night when I sat there right close to on the platform and, I'm heard, and I heard him say, that's them Jews that's been slaughtered back there through the Holocaust. And I got to thinking, I'm a fool. When I had told a woman that morning from Chicago 
It's impossible for a Jew to be saved unless he's accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you go back and look at the records of the, the many Jews that were sent to the gas chambers, to the firing squad, yes, and in places, there were some of those Jews who went to the firing squads cursing, while others leading their little babies and children holding on to dad and mom. Mommy, what's going on? And then there's suddenly the rattle of machine guns, and they're falling like flies. It's not all that six millions that's in that great multitude of the fifth seal. But through all of that Holocaust period, think of them spiritual Jews. They loved God's Word. They loved the knowledge of Him. The Elohim that had gave them the law. They loved Him for that. And they died for that. They refused to recant. They went to their graves wondering, my God, why does all this have to be? And there they are. Hallelujah. Under the altar. Grace. Crying. That's not back in the Middle Ages. That was back there in the 40s. There they are crying. How long? How long will it be before you avenge our blood on them? And here come Angeli Beans, clothing them with a white robe. And then it was said to each one of them, he's still a little seasoned. Tell your fellow brethren and servants to be killed as you are. Well, I tell you, brothers and sisters, that opened up my mind to a deeper understanding. They were not in the bride, but they're in that element that's going to have white robes. It shows God separated them. And don't think, brothers and sisters, that just meant only the Jews in the Holocaust. When I go back to the Spanish Inquisition, that lasted over a hundred years. I've read of the torture, the anguish that that Catholic system brought them into. Yes, while heretic Christians was martyred and butchered and slaughtered, there was Jews right there. So you could trace that back all down to the centuries of time. So God is a merciful God, isn't He? And that's why, brothers and sisters, when we do come at the beginning of the week, there is the rapture of the bride that starts in the beginning and consummates right there. Right there is where God stops dealing with Gentiles for that purpose. And He goes to the Jewish nation. And in that are Gentiles of every era of time from the beginning of the apostolic era. But in that same period of time, when he sees his 144,000 sealed by the two prophets, it's then he saw this great multitude. And traditionists have always said, that's pointed to the great tribulation. Here, that is a lie. Now we've proved it. Because first off, when John saw it, he couldn't count them, could he? Common sense would tell you they are not the product of one century of time. They've come out of many generations and many nations. And the gospel has not predominated over the whole world at the same time. You know that. It starts in the Middle East and slowly moves westward. Then by the time we come, to open up into the new world. When the Reformation has had its impact in Europe, out of Europe came the early Christians because they wanted a place to be free from the political state of Europe. And when the new world opened up, the pilgrim Christians came here and the old world began to die and go into apostasy. And you see, brothers and sisters, in the Western world, the gospel has remained predominantly. Out of America alone, there's been more gospel printed in the last 100 and some years than there has been by the whole rest of the world put together. It's because of the technology. 
And we had a society that was interesting. Now with this in mind, we have to move on very fast. So you take that 13th chapter and you're moving it closer and closer to this period of time. Now then, when we come to 1963, chapter 4, 5, and 6 was dropped in place. We have the knowledge of what it brought. But it left the seventh seal, which is in chapter 1, I mean chapter 8, verse 1. Now then, so the knowledge of 4, 5, and 6, we're carrying it in our minds, not on written paper necessarily. But as we come closer to this, watch. We're waiting for a revelation on something, aren't we? But we've got to realize something's going to go on in the Middle East. And I have to say this morning, next week they're supposed to come out with a road map. And they're hoping to be able by now, by 2005, to have a Palestinian guarantee state. And I have to say, now they're playing with God's time. Now then, so we're looking forward here. Now we're living in the latter days of the grace age. We're waiting for that seventh seal, aren't we? Now take chapter 10 and put it right under that first verse of chapter 8 on this side. Because when that seventh seal is broke, that means time is over for the Gentiles as far as the gospel. Now that Jesus is off of the mercy seat, he's seen standing on earth on this side of the week, Amen. not on this side of the week. Do you understand me? We're looking at the pictures, not the numbers necessarily. So when that first verse of chapter 8 is opened, then you push the rest of the chapter across the line. But then you bring chapter 10 right in under that. Because now Jesus is on earth in angelic form. And as soon as his feet touch the earth, he cries with a loud voice. He's not weeping because he's sorry. He yells, now, Amen. now, Amen. and seven thunders yes. immediately Praise express the themselves. Amen. 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 We've got a bunch of ignoramus people today that don't know what thunder from lightning. If verse 1 of chapter 6, there was one thunder and seven angels that accompanied that man, but he's only one voice. Chapter 10, verse 7. He's a voice, yes. not voices. But angels were with him. But there's only one thunder. And out of that came the revelation of six seals. Brother Gary, I'm glad. I didn't hear the thunder. But I sure heard what he brought. Because I know he had heard it. And I'm going to, I'm going to stand here well. How loud was it? That's none of your business. I heard what he said. Amen. Now then, but we're getting close to this time. While we're watching Israel, let's look at ourselves as he talks to us out of that book. So chapter 10 is right under that first verse of chapter 8. And as soon as he cries, now, that means he's on earth. To reveal himself to his bride people. Amen. Who will not be running here and there. To every kind of a meeting. Because there's a carcass prepared. Oh, yes. For the scribes. Hallelujah. That's given the sheep. The eagles. Yes. Something to eat. Amen. You act crazy brother Jackson. Well I, I grant you I am. I'm crazy for the Lord. And crazy for his word. But it makes sense. From the areas of Christendom, wherever it's at, there's going to come men. They're not doctors. They're not professors. 
But there are men called of God who's got a mind sold out on one thing. First off, they're going to be in unity. It won't matter whether they're black, yellow, red, or white. They're going to be in agreement. And when the Spirit of God begins to deal with them, they're going to get a revelation. What is it, Brother Jackson? Something pertaining to the imminent coming of that bridegroom for his church. And some are so wrapped up in the angelic side, they can't even see the human side. I'm not worried about the angels that was talking with Brother Branham. I'm talking about brothers and sisters, the ones that's going to be responsive to them seven men. Because it says, seven thunders, not one. Seven thunders uttered their voices, plural. And in chapter 6, there was only one voice. And that's the voice of the seventh angel. Mentioned of in chapter 10, verse 7. Because it's His voice, it's His message, that we've been living under the effects of it. Right to this day. And I have to say this morning, that's His voice that's going to bring an end to this whole thing. It's not what I say. It's what He has said. We're only, we will say, the ones that's adding a little bit into it to lift it up and keep putting it on out there for the proper meaning. So I hope you understand. As we see chapter 10 in its place, it's going to give us an understanding about the imminent coming of Christ. Now I want you to leave that right, right there. On down at the end of that 10th chapter, we come into to verses 9 and 10 and 11. Then the voice that spoke to him above, go to that angel. Now the angel didn't have a book. It's a scroll. Because in his hand it was open. So when he went to the angel... He said, give me the scroll. Then the angel said to him, take it, eat it up. For it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey. But in thy belly, bitter. Bad case of heartburn. That's just exactly what it is. And as he did, yes. And then the angel said, for thou must prophesy again before many nations, kings, Language and so forth. Now John's dead. He's not coming back again. Just like John, I mean, just like Elijah. He was supposed to be sent to prophesy again. But it wasn't Elijah. It was the dawning on Elijah. How many see the point? So I'm saying this morning, let's get it right. That anointed that give John this revelation to write it, what John wrote it in simple means, it's going to be literally taken and eaten and digested. And it's going to acquaint us with something other here in the end time pertaining to his imminent close return. When them thunders are sounded, which will give to the living bride, and I have to say, it'll be something so simple, the church world wouldn't even know it. They say, you crazy people. But then, brothers and sisters, I have to say, that anointing that fell on John is going to come on a ministry of men. Wherever they are in this earth, this world despises the name of Jesus and Christendom. But now, little church, these kings and potentates and celebrities and doctors of this and educators, somewhere out of the rank of the bride, are going to come little men. Sir, straighten up! Because God is sending a warning. They'll listen then. Because there'll be authority in what they say. For thou will prophesy. No, you're not going in before the president and say, I have a message from you. You see how I have taken four years in such and such a seminary 
you're going to have a revelation say, Mr. President, either turn away from your miserable plans, because if you don't, you're sending thousands of men to their death, and you'll weep over the ruin of it. That's an illustration. And I have to say also, then your local politicians and your critics, I have to say God's going to use local. And while they want to crit criticize you, then when that person will come along and say, pray for me. Listen to me. You want a miracle done. Then God can touch somebody that the doctors have given up. The community has given up. And now then he's healed. His whole physical being is changed. And the daily papers caught it. From out of nowhere. Here come some little people. Not supposed to have nothing. Supposed to be ignorant. But God used them to leave a testimony of his power, his grace and mercy. And it won't be the ecumenical council. How many understand me? Amen. How many understand the 10th chapter now? Amen. Now I have to say, brothers and sisters, when that 10th chapter has fully applied its objective to the bride, now that angelic being that stood here on one foot on the land and one on the sea, he delivered the message. Now he goes to Israel. For the beginning of the week. Mm. There he is standing on the water of Jordan. John saw him in Daniel chapter 12. Hallelujah. Because yeah. yeah. in our side in chapter 10. He lifted up his hand and swore by him. That time should be no longer. That's to the bride. Amen. But to Israel. He lifted up both hands. Oh. And said, let it be for a time. Times and dividing a time. That's the end of it. Right. Now then, when he has gone into the Jordan River, now you've got the eighth chapter laying on this side of the weak line. How many understands? Because the rest of it's all these trumpets. Now then, I said yesterday morning, you don't bring in chapter 7 first. You've got to bring in chapter 11. But Brother Jackson, chapter 7 tells us that 144,000 are going to be sealed. By who? It's two prophets. Well, when you go to chapter 11, what's the first thing you see? John was given a read, go measure the temple. So that proves that the temple has already been in the process of building. So by the time we come on this side, now then chapter 11 shows the two prophets. They're the two witnesses. They're the two candlesticks. That was in the type of Zechariah's prophecy. Now when they can lift up and start prophesying, how many can see now? They're going to prophesy for 1,203 score days. Now then, the verses of chapter 8 and the last verse chapters, I mean the seal of chapter 11 are all in continuity. And for three and a half years you pull the 144,000 in here and you pull the woman that flees. Back here's where she gets her information. So we can see chapter 7, chapter 8, Chapter 11 and chapter 12 are now on this side of the line and time moves on for three more and a half years. And brother, that woman Israel is going to receive her revelation. On this side, not over here. So we can say this. It's here that the 144,000 receive the information what to do when this time comes.
It's on this side that the woman of the Revelation 12 will receive the information where to go to when this time comes. Now then, that moves us then to chapter 14. Because that dirty Antichrist, let's go back and take a look at him. I said you take chapter 13 and you start it because it's a gradual growing through time to eventually it has materialized itself. But remember according to Paul's revelation, when the time comes for the bride to be raptured, and I have heard since World War II, doctors of prophecy, this and that, the rapture can take place any minute. I know you have too. That's not so. God's got a precise time fixed. Now, he can come from me right now or tonight. But he'll not come for his bride until everything that's pertaining to it is going to be completed. So, brothers and sisters, when we see then that the time has come, that those chapters have crossed the line, that I want to say this clearly. Take chapter 17. Now, you cannot take the two chapters and keep them consistent. The 13th is first. But by the time time brings it to this, where the 13th chapter, the beast is complete. Listen to me. The lamb piece, beast, something has happened to it. It drops out of the picture. Now the 17th chapter. Because the man of sin is in it. That spirit rises out of hell. And he takes over that government. That head that was healed on the 13th chapter. How many understand me now? That's why Paul said, concerning the coming of the Lord, that's the rapture. And our gathering together unto him, that day will not come. Unless there's first a falling away, he said. Well, we've always interpreted that. That's apostasy. That's the way the church world is. But the Aramaic translation says this. There will become an open rebellion. Which means there'll be a spirit hit this world. And from the realm of the intellects and the political leadership, it's a rebellion against the knowledge of God. Communism started it. Now socialism has brought, brand, got it. And in America, materialism has become the slogan of the day. Don't mention God in our schools, our learning. And we're getting closer to this hour. But as we get closer to this hour, the world in general don't want God. The devil's got his hour. And so the same system... Now he comes on the scene, and did not Paul say, for that man of sin will first appear. Isn't that right? Amen. Who's a son of perdition? Yeah. One ordained to lead something to destruction. Yeah. Where's that spirit come from? Out of hell. He takes over the system of democracy, of governments, of kingdoms, and economics. Yeah. And brothers and sisters, that's when that head that was wounded, that now has been given life to it, and it was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Through this period, he succeeds to leading the world in what he thinks is prosperity. But when the end of that period comes, and them two prophets in the first part of the week have demonstrated the power of God in the Middle East and has put this Catholic religion to shame and all other apostate religions to shame, that Pope cannot help but look there on the TV of Nain at night, evening, and see what happened in that first three and a half years. Don't tell me that Pope's not going to say. And the devil's sitting on his shoulders. And when that three and a half years is just about done for them prophets, that dirty pope, 
He is no longer going to be the man that kisses little babies and blesses your little children. He's going to become a Satanist. That's Daniel 11. He'll no longer worship the God of his fathers. He'll not regard the respect of womanhood. He'll only regard the God of silver, gold, materialism. Because this is the hour of materialism. It's the God of this world. And the world loves it. But they don't realize they're worshiping the devil. And he sits behind the scenes laughing. Boy, I've really got them now. And the politicians with their silly ideas through the United Nations are going to make this world a better place. In it. They're just going to turn it into a bigger, deep, deeper nest of hell. So now you see the 17th chapter. <clears throat> and this is in full power. She took over the restored framework. This was the slowly domestically, politically, militarily, scientifically, and all everything. But when the hour was right, now then, that dirty devil can come on it. Through here he deceives. But these prophets sound their trumpets. Judgment, judgment, judgment. But when we come to the end of that period, that dirty Antichrist out of Rome... He's no longer being going to be this pope that kisses babies. He's going to join the political, satanist systems of the world. And he's going to go to Israel and show them, I'll show you who's God. And he'll take that international police force out of Europe. I'll show the world how much power I've got. And he'll cause them prophets, their dead bodies to lie in the streets of Jerusalem for three days and a half. Yes, flies will bloat them. They'll stink. And the godless systems of the world will rescind weapons, I mean, yes, one another. Hallelujah. Now them troublemakers are gone. But oh, they done delivered their message. So the woman, hallelujah, when she began to sense this trouble, then people begin to go to the airports. I want a ticket to such and such a plane on LL. American Airlines, they're overbooked. How many know what I'm talking about? She fled because she's given two wings of an eagle. It's the message of the two prophets. She's going to buy a one-way ticket to that place that's already ordained by God. Amen. Flee there! Amen. It's a one-way ticket to safety, to shelter. Amen. And the assemblies of God and the Baptists and all of them said, oh, they're going to Petra. Well, I've been there twice. I wouldn't live there if you give me the whole canyon. It's about 80 miles from Jerusalem, the way the crow flies, to there. So you traditionalists take about a million Jews there. And they think that God's going to feed them. Wherever God has played, prepared a place for them, and God ain't going to feed them. It tells you in the 12th chapter of Revelation, and they fled into that place in the wilderness where they is a plural pronoun. They who? Well, I don't believe in three gods. In this case, it's only one God. But He's got a people over there called they. Hallelujah. And their hearts done been conditioned, brother. <laughs> and they're ready to receive them. Hallelujah. And while they're fleeing the 144,000, they've already been revelated. And brothers, they're going to go right back to the nations they are associated with. They've got friendship there. They can speak their language. And they're going to preach the everlasting gospel to the world of mortal flesh. Number one, they're going to condemn that devilish spirit, atheism. First one, fear God, worship Him. 
Don't go to the house, White House now and talk like that. But in that hour, they will. Because God's going to absolutely cause them to have ears to hear. And I can see them as they'll go to certain colleges. God will make them set back. And they will preach the everlasting gospel to the world. What is it for? It's to warn an element of young mortal people. Fear God. And number two, get out of this Babylonian system. Listen carefully now. I want to explain that. Well, the bride's gone here. How many can see that? And the foolish virgins have done being killed here. Well, who are they talking to over here? Come out of her, my people. It's that element of mortal flesh that's still alive. It's the last warning they'll ever get. Get away from that system. And that's followed up. And don't none of you join that cashless society. Now how many knows what I'm talking about? The whole world is pushing rapidly toward that. That's why they want to abduct. They've counterfeited credit cards and everything else. If they can put a mark in a horse, then no matter where he's stole, they can look in that flesh. And what is it? It's a little chip. The chip tells where the horse is at, Amen. where he came from, who his owner is. So when they put a mark on you, it isn't something visible. It's a little computer chip. That's why it can be in the Ford or in your hand. And the 666 is the prefix to the whole thing. How many understand that? Because the prefix introduces you to the economics of it. That's all it does. So now, brothers and sisters, so we can see now the 14th chapter, how it's materialized, and here they go. But watch. Now the 15th chapter, that's that sea of glass. That's some people that's been slaughtered through that period of time. You know, brothers and sisters, whenever everybody was made to believe that this was the Great Tribulation, I always wondered, well, why did God separate this from that? But this is what was produced up through time to that point. But this is what was absolutely killed right in this period of time, and there's their spirits right up there to heaven. Now you see the 15th chapter. And at the same time, look at your 16th chapter. He starts pouring out the vials. My. Read them. That's why, that's not the type of a tribulation that the others have been. It's God's tribulation of hell that He's sending to this ungodly element of humanity. Read what it says. Sores. Droughts. He'll torment men with great heat. Joel says, the seed will lie in the clods, not able to sprout. God's going to give man hell on earth. Men will seek death. Does that mean nobody will die? That don't mean that at all. It means some of these scientists, God's got it in for them. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, I wouldn't want their diplomas. He's absolutely going to turn hell loose on them. And I have to say, when God gets mad at a bunch of people, he has no mercy on them. Because they've done killed the spiritual Jew and the foolish virgins who else? Is he going to turn tribulation on? It's the ungodly of the world. So brothers and sisters, look at them vials. He gives them blood to drink. Water. The fish life will die. I've watched in the last three years where these whales in different areas of the earth have came in from the deep seas into these shallow sounds 
And people will go out there and spend hours trying their best to push them and get them back into the ocean. They come back. You know, brothers and sisters, it kind of tells me there's something out there. And they're trying to tell mankind it's bad. But they can't talk. So the little free creatures just come in. They don't want to die out there in that mess. Now they think I'm crazy. But what it says, and every creature in the sea. Well, does that mean there ain't going to be marine, no more marine life? Don't talk like that. God knows how to save every whale, every porpoise. All he needs is two. He don't need a boatload. I hope you understand me now. And it don't mean all the fowl are going to die. There's going to be some of them left. So I have to say that 16th chapter, vile after vile. The ungodly of the world don't know what to do. And I have to say, yes, it is tribulation. But it's not the kind of tribulation that they've always expected it to be. It's when God absolutely frowns on mankind with all their education. So brothers and sisters, that 17th chapter, when you look at it and follow it right through this whole week of time. Oh, she comes right through here. And as we begin to come to the close of this last three and a half years, now then, the latter verses of the 14th chapter, which talked about this. He saw an angelic being in heaven coming forth with a sword. And another angel said to him, Go gather the clusters of the earth. What is he saying? The nations are ripe. It's time to pluck them. It's time to press them out. So, brother, there was a spirit began to go forth into the kings of the earth. And when we come, brothers and sisters, to that sixth vial, three unclean spirits came out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Right. For these are devils speaking lies going forth to the kings of the earth to gather them together for that day, great day of his wrath. That's not Ezekiel 38, you poor doctors of divinity. Ezekiel 38 was full bill right back here. And I want you to know it's not going to be a three-week war. The Russians and Irans and all of them might be several months in preparing for it. But God's going to bring it to an end in a few hours. Because when He turns it loose, when's that, Brother Jackson? Ezekiel 38 says, when will this be? When my people that have been brought back into the land, that's been brought back from the sword, and my people dwell safely, the herbs are no longer... No, Saudi Arabia is hauling gold and incense over the deserts to help them build the temple. Read it in Isaiah 60. And from Lebanon, I mean from Jordan, here come a Bedouin tribe. They want to bring sheep for Israel to offer on the altar. And God says, I will accept it. You try it now. See what you get. But I want you to know, when God gets through with this stinking world right along in here, He can do brothers and sisters in one day's time what it will take politicians six years to do. So when the secret war, or miracle war that I'm talking about has materialized, how long will it last, Brother Jackson? Not long enough for you to go to bed two or three times and get up and take a bath. Hallelujah. 
Because there's going to be angelic beings in that fight. Israel's got high-tech weaponry too. But it's not going to be a war that's all by high-tech. Otherwise, they wouldn't see God. But when the angelic being, when Michael gets involved, uh oh And he's got his army out there today. They're getting lined up. In those days, now Michael stand up. The prince of my people. And every one of the Jews that's in his book of life will be delivered. And brothers and sisters, there's going to be a war in the Middle East. Educators. And there's going to be Egyptians, Jordanian pilots, Syrian pilots. All of them. They'll try to get in their fighter planes to go out to meet the Israelis. And all of a sudden they'll see a mirage of planes. Coming right at them. Yeah, there could be a few Israelis in F-18s in it. But all the rest of them, they're not chariots of fire. They're mirages of fighter planes. And there's angelic beings in every one of them. And so when the enemy approaches them, they're now they're confused. And God said he would put fear of the riders of horses in that day. I don't want to be on the enemy's side in that day. I want to be on the side of the Israel. I know I sound crazy this morning. In fact, I can't make it sound crazy enough. Because I see a beautiful picture here, brothers and sisters, getting ready to unfold in front of us. Amen. I want you to know, as we're approaching toward the end of that era, there's your sixth seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh vial. Jesus Christ comes under all of them. That means His wrath has been poured out in that respect. And still the world has not repented. They still haven't seen a thing. While at the same time, there was an element of mortal flesh that's opened their eyes. And they've stayed back. And God has preserved them that they was able to exist. And that little woman, she fled. She left the whole area of the Middle East. She fled to that place in the wilderness. And there were some people there, friendly to them. Come. Yes, praise the Lord. I've got a bedroom. You can eat at my table. And there they're going to be nurtured. There they're going to be sheltered and fed and cared for. No, it's not a supernatural act of God. It's God dealing with an element of people that He's done, judged, and put them in position for it. See, it's already written. He has a place already prepared. Amen. Well, I grant you right now, there's a lot of hypocrisy in America. They don't see that. But wait till God gets through pouring out His judgment upon it. And I have to say, if the FBI is listening this morning, you go ahead and laugh. Because the day are coming. To the president then, the senator then, and the congressman then, some of us Christians are going to send you an email. Amen. <laughs> what do you think about all of this? Hey. It's one thing for the world to watch what we've done over there. But wait, brothers and sisters, until they see a miracle war take place hey. in the Middle East. Hallelujah. I see Buddhists now. You couldn't change it for nothing. Hindus, Shintus. But the same people that's looked through the television tubes and seen this war over there, where do they look through the television tubes and see what the hand of God has done in the Middle East? They ain't going to be Buddhist no more. Well, how can you say that, Brother Jack? Because it says in 7 I, the second chapter, the 11th verse, in that day I will famish all the gods. That's the religions of the earth. In so much that every man will worship Him from his own place. 
Now, I see a young Hindu man with his little old stinking red dot. But when he sees that TV tube and sees the hand of God and angelic beings fighting for Israel and the whole world begin to look at that. When he sees that era begin to come to a close, don't tell me, brothers and sisters, he's going to put more dots. <laughs> he's going to get up off of his knees. And he's going to say, Honey, I hope you're with me. Because I ain't what I used to be. Because I see something now. I see the true God. No wonder, brothers and sisters, when Israel then says, we'll now build our temple, not so old decrepit will come to Israel. I'd like to help you all a little bit. Sons and strangers in the prime of life study to be professional men of trade. They're not coming for looking for a handout. They want to contribute their expertise, their profession, and help Israel. And it says in that day, that I will milk the breast of kings. That's God's way of touching their hearts. You give me that for a little while. That don't change the overall political picture. Time just goes right on. But it literally means this. And the nation that will not contribute, God says, I will waste them. I'll bankrupt them. So now, brothers and sisters, we're getting to the pretty close to the end. All of these things have been poured out. Armageddon been fought. This 144,000 condemned that Catholic system. And somewhere in that period of time, them ten horns on that beast now that's alive and functioning, they'll turn against it. And I've been privileged to travel through different areas of the European country, from Spain to France. Catholics, churches, properties, they own fabulous investments in gas and oil companies. When them ten horns have come to the conclusion, we will no longer honor the God of any religion. They're now totally socialistic, materialistic, because that's got to be their destiny. They'll confiscate that Catholic system. That's why them mortals that are still in it have to get out of it. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know when they close the stocks. How many understand me now? Don't tell me it will not create a little economic slump for a while. And I'm going to say this. Them kings of the east which have been sitting over there spewing, stealing, waiting for an opportunity. North Korea. She's just practically telling us to go jump in the creek. That she has a right to make her atomic weapons and sell them. Well, something's got to happen to America. And I have to say, something up the road right in front of us is going to happen. I have to say, we're going to come home and we will no longer have military or political or economic influence in the Far East. Right. Them kings of the East have absolutely got to be on their own. And when this world has come through this, there are no doubt them kings of the East are going to look toward the Western world and realize something's going on. And they're going to say, now's our time. And God's going to remove the bears. And they're going to be brought to Armageddon. And if it tells you, dear brothers and sisters, 
He brought, brings them into the wine press, and there the blood will flow to the bridle of the horse. Two hundred million men. That don't change them. The West will still be victorious. As that era has passed, I'm going to close now a little bit. Let's take a look now at the 19th chapter. She's hanging right over this era. The 19th chapter is about she went up here. But right here is where she's seen, sitting on white horses. As that battle of Armageddon has been brought to an end. Then it says this, brothers and sisters, as you open up the 19th chapter and look at it. First thing you see, the bride's been up there at the marriage supper, feasting and celebrating. But when you come about halfway through, then you see the Lord Jesus on the white horse. Then you see the bride on the white horses. And now heaven's open. Brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Why didn't he elaborate on that? Tradition has always said, well, that's there. And Matthew 24, 21, when he's talking about Jerusalem, he says, then should be great tribulation. We'll be found out yesterday. That was not pointed down here. That's not when all things that are written might be fulfilled. That was fulfilled in 70 A.D. So we can see, brothers and sisters, what our beginning is over. Now the Lord is coming. And look at the beast. Here it stood in the 19th chapter. All with high-tech weaponry. But not a one of them believes in God. Not a one. So you can see now, brothers and sisters, why the 144,000 had to warn an element of the mortal flesh. It was the only way of keeping them away from the destruction of the system. Our system. So the beast is ready to make war against Jesus. Only a fool would think like that. The founders of America a hundred years ago would have not even thought of such a thing. Even back in World War II, our founders wouldn't have thought of such a thing. But now we got a bunch of politicians, brothers and sisters. This is their concept. But it's been on the Europeans for a long time. And so by the time that hour has come, you can see now, brothers and sisters, why Paul said back here, for well, there shall be come an open rebellion and the man of sin be revealed. It's not just a false Christianity. It's a rebellion against the knowledge of God. And, and through that period of time, the devil is going to absolutely have his way. And I will say, brothers and sisters, there will be no mercy. Because out of his mouth will go a sharp two-edged sword. And they can sit there with all their high-tech weaponry aimed. But when he speaks the word of authority... I have to say, the power of God can absolutely magnetize every weapon. He can cause men to become so dumbfounded they can't move. And it says, and he'll slay them with the sword. No, it's not a literal sword. But it's a stroke of death. And I'll say, and the slaying of the Lord in that day shall be many. For they shall lie from one end of the earth to the other. Come on, you educated doctors. You scientists, you professors, your hour is coming. The last 60 years, God has let you have your way. But He's ready to reap a harvest. And you're just about fully ripe. Ready for the picking. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, I want to be on one of them white horses. I don't care whether it's in the front or back where. I just want to be there. And brother, oh yeah, there's still going to be a few animals left. Because he'll say to the fowls of the heaven, come! 
And to the beast of the field, come. Because I'm going to give you a great supper on the feast. Now then, you undertakers can go bankrupt. The cemeteries can go without being mowed. <laughs> How many understand? I hope you've gotten a picture of the book of Revelation this morning. Now then, let me bring you back here. I want to say this before we go. I don't know what all them seven thunders will actually say in, other, in the utterance of words. But I have to say this, brothers and sisters. They're not going to tell you the day or the hour when Jesus is coming. Because until we've been changed from this mortal to the immortal side, we have a tendency to become foolish. Because some people would say, oh, if he's coming on the third day of such and such a month, at such and such a hour, I ain't going to do another thing. That's the way to look at it. But remember the illustration he used in Matthew. Amen. Then shall be two lying in the bed. So that means somewhere it's going to be on the dark side of the planet. And again, two shall be working in the field. So it lets us know that's going to be daylight somewhere. And then shall be two grinding at the mill. So that means industry is spin, still spinning. So brothers and sisters... Now let's go to the 21st verse, or 27th verse. There's the lightning shining from the east to the west. Did you ever see a dark night and a storm is rolling up? <clears throat> you begin to feel the winds. But all of a sudden you hear, begin to hear a rumble. And all of a sudden a streak of lightning flashes across the sky. It lights up the whole earth, doesn't it? I have to say, when he appears to take away his bride, the spirit world is going to open up to the bride. Remember, the spirit world is not beyond Mars nor Jupiter. It's just right out there. And he can open that up and let you see something that will send you a shouting. Oh, I want to go now. I have to say, when we actually, when the spirit world is opened up to us, you won't have to know what day or hour. Because it comes as a surprise. Amen. And you don't have to stand down here, oh, i got to get my shoes on. i got to go right quick. You'll automatically rise. Because what does the scripture say? The dead in Christ shall rise first. So you'll be a standing. And all of a sudden, you see them dead saints appearing. Don't tell me you're not going to get excited. And together we'll be changed. The spirit world, you're looking at it. The natural world don't even see it, but you will. Because you're going to be lifted up into it. Well, Brother Jackson said, we'd meet him in the clouds. It's not coming a storm. It's clouds of glory. Hallelujah. It's the power of God that's lifting you into the spirit world. Amen. So don't strain too hard. <clears throat> How many understand my point today? Well, I've kept you here long enough. And I know some of you have got a long ways to go when you leave here. May God bless you. If he gives us another opportunity when fall comes, we'll be gathered back here. Same place. We'll see what he has then for us. But until then, take this, study about it, and pray for me. Because <laughs> I have to say, this book of Revelation is going to become so plain to you. It's just going to be written on your mind. You'll go to bed looking at it. You'll get up thinking about it. And each day you live, it'll become plainer and plainer. Because time puts you closer to the development and the fulfillment of it. Gracious Lord, take these words today. We're thankful, Father, for the moments that you gave us to have an opportunity to be together. And Lord, we feast upon your presence and your truth. 
because it's bread to our soul, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that you've allowed me to see through the years. Oh, God. Take us safely to our places of abode. Help us, Lord, through the trials that we might encounter in the tomorrows and the days to come. And Lord, help each one of us to overcome our trials and the situation that the enemy would throw at us. And Lord, if, you, if it's in your plan to give us another meeting in the fall, then keep us, Lord, with the right kind of attitude that we can grow and see our brothers and sisters in a greater light. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I want to say one. Oh, kisika pia kafasa. Si kala kama kia kafasa. Si kala kama kia kafasa. Si kala kama kia kafasa. Si kama kia si kama kala. Oh, kisika pala kia kafasa. Ali ko mai si katoi inyemanyo. Nakwe kia saketwai taleo. Baleko tapakwen se taleitikon. Takwane ti ashblen. Lamatorien kamen gowai mamakoyai. Yase kumashon ayakuna matale ti katolobai. Little ones today as I look upon thy heart in life. Dost thou not realize it is I the great shepherd. That have touched thy heart and mine from many places. And I have brought thee as my little sheep. To become a flock. I have gathered thee into a place of security. And that thou mightest have comfort in thy heart and soul. And from this day and onward. Learn to recognize my voice. And how I deal within thy heart and life. For I look upon thee with great favor. And the hour has come when I will not withhold no good thing from those that have a hunger to know me, saith the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> I was just getting ready to say something other here. It's a little point I don't want nobody to ever forget. As you look at this place here where it's great tribulations, through 2,000 years of wars, turmoils, and everything, you see those ones that didn't get to live long enough to really let their lives develop into something that really they could actually become that type of a person. But I think of the young men through the hundreds of years that has been forced to go off to a war. When they left home, they have remembered what mothers have said and daddies have said. Son, don't forget, there's a God watching over you. And through the conflicts of time, the young men that have died on the fields of battle their legs have been blown out from under them. Their bodies have been half blown away. And they're, not, they're laying there breathing their last breath. There was a poem found on the body of a dead soldier. And he says, Father, I know in a short time I'll be coming home. I saw this poem years ago. But remember, he didn't get to live long enough here in this life. He died on the field of battle. 
He was like the thief on the cross. In Iwo Jima, in World War II, the military had a magazine. They called it the Yank Magazine. <clears throat> the Marines have landed. And they've come under heavy fire. And they designed certain men, picked them out to send them in through the bush to try to contact the enemy and find their positions. And this patrol moves in. <clears throat> and they come under a heavy mortar attack. One of these mortar shells have evidently exploded in the air in front of this soldier. He was alive when he went in there. There must have been something in his mind. Because when he returned, his whole front of his head was blown away. But here he comes back to the rear. A walking body. No eyes, no nose, no mouth. It even startled the troops that seen him returning. And they thought him, how can he walk? Does he know where he's going? When the whole front of his head's blown away. But you know, I see an angel. Are they not ministering spirits? I see an angel. He watched his mind, what his mind was on when he went in there. And he didn't want him to fall. So he took him by the hand. With no eyes, no nose, no mouth, no nothing. He leads him back. And he collapses. Yes. Yep, you politicians and educators, you're crazy. There are hours coming. God bless you, brothers and sisters.